Okay, yesterday we learned about time dilation, or the idea that time flows at different rates for people in different reference frames, which is kind of odd. You would think time is absolute, but apparently it's not. Um, so another way to, to say it, I guess, is if you're flying by Earth at like ridiculously high speed, and you see a distant star go supernova, people on Earth won't see it yet, even though you're right next to them. It's a different time frame. Time flows differently for you than it does for people on Earth. Uh, so exactly when that supernova happens, at what moment in time, is relative to the observer. Um, now, today I want to look at the Lorentz contraction, which is um, shows how space also is distorted by moving at high velocity compared to other reference frames. Um, so once again, we'll take an observer in, oops, in a spaceship, which I should get back to my pen. Okay, so there's my spaceship moving again at speed V relative to some outside observer. So the guy inside the spaceship is holding a meter stick, edge on like that. Um, and he obviously measures the length of that meter stick, L, as one meter. But what about someone out here, outside of the spaceship, <laughs> beautiful astronaut, um, who's looking through the porthole of the ship and measuring the length of the meter stick as people do, right? Um, he's going to measure the meter stick as being a different length. Now, um, uh, once again, I'll repeat yesterday's equation just so you have it for reference. Delta T equals delta T naught over square root of 1 minus V squared over C squared. Delta T naught is the proper time, which means it's the, the time as measured by the guy inside the spaceship relative to things that are going on inside the spaceship. So when he sees one second click off the, the clock inside his spaceship, it's delta T naught is one second. The proper time is one second. Delta T is the time as measured by the outside observer out here watching the spaceship go by. Um, and he's going to see that click of the, the clock to be more than one second. In other words, the clock's going to be moving in slow motion. It takes more than one second for a second to, to tick off of the clock. That's the time in an outside observer's reference frame. And again, that we call time dilation. Like your pupils dilate, they get bigger. Time dilates, it gets bigger, it takes longer for events to happen. Um, now, if we do the same kind of thing with, with length, the length of that meter stick, measure the time it takes, well, measure the, the a light beam going across the meter stick. It's going to be different from for the guy in the meter inside the spaceship versus the guy watching the spaceship go by as the meter stick's moving forward with the light beam. Um, and so it turns out, I won't go through the derivation of this because you've seen the time de derivation and it's, it's not terribly different. But what you get is the length of the meter stick as measured by the guy outside of the spaceship this distorted guy up here, which I can't find my cursor, there it is, this distorted guy up here. Um, that length is going to equal the proper length, which is the length as measured by the guy inside the spaceship, one meter, so this is a meter stick. In this case, it's multiplied by the square root of one minus V squared over C squared. Okay, so the time dilation equation, you divide by that that what we call gamma factor in um, the the um, length variation you get a multiplication by that that um, I can't I lost the word already uh, that that gamma factor um, so notice that means in this case you're multiplying by a value less than one okay since v is always less than c this is going to be point something here one minus point something is less than one, point something. Take that times the length, the proper length, and you're gonna find that the length as measured from an outside observer is less than the proper length. So again, the guy inside the spaceship, who I didn't draw, measures the meter stick to be exactly one meter long. That's L naught, the proper length. 
the guy outside the spaceship, when he's observing it go by and using his telescope to watch the meter stick and measure how long it is, he would measure the meter stick to be less than one meter. How much less? Depends on the velocity. The bigger the velocity, the bigger this fraction becomes, and the, the smaller you know, point value, the decimal value is going to become. <coughs> so, if V is very small, like 10 meters per second compared to the speed of light, it's going to be 1 minus 0 0.000001, and essentially L naught is going to equal L, and you're not going to notice a difference. So if I hold a meter stick and run past your desk, which I always tend to do, I guess, right? Um, you're going to measure the length of that meter stick to be the same as I measure it, one meter within any reasonable number of significant digits. But if I use my superpowers and I run past your desk at 0.9 times the speed of light, then you're going to actually measure that meter stick to be half a meter or, or whatever. We have to go through the calculation. But you'd find it to be less than one meter long. All the little centimeter markings would be all crammed together. Okay, so space itself gets distorted. It's, it's not the meter stick that's shrinking, obviously. It's space itself that's shrinking. Um, so as you're moving at high speeds, the universe around you appears to be distorted or, or compressed. Now, it turns out that visually it's not going to look like just like being squished because um, light is coming at you from different angles and at, at, at different speeds relative, well, at, at um, at different angles relative to your speed. And so you end up getting some weird visual effects like actually like a rotation occurring. So if you were watching a train go by at nearly the speed of light, the train cars in the, the middle would look squished or near the edges would look squished, but they'd also be rotated. So, so um, some weird effects kind of happen there. But this, this discrepancy in the little length measurement for the, the proper length versus the, um, the externally measured length that's called the Lorentz contraction, named after, obviously, some guy who, who first figured this out. Interestingly enough, Lorentz did these calculations before Einstein came along. Uh, remember the Michelson-Morley experiment, where we were supposed to have an ether wind, which made the light slow down going in one direction, and therefore the light beams were going to be out of focus, or I'm sorry, out of phase, and you get a different bright dark pattern from interference. Um, Lorentz kind of, in order to try to save the, the, um, the ether, you know, the, the existence of this mysterious ether, to try to save that, what he decided was that what if the ether wind, actually the ether penetrates the earth somehow, and the whole earth and everything in it and on it gets compressed by the ether, just like if you hit a golf ball, it gets compressed. Um, and he calculated it, it would have to be exactly what we found here, the compression of the Earth and every object on the Earth by the ether wind in order to make the Michelson-Morley experiment work. So this length contraction could be explained by some sort of bizarre ether compression that's happening, which in fact is what Lorenz had in mind when he derived this. Um, but Einstein said, it is, is an easier way to do this. Just throw away the ether. We don't need it. And look at it as just space being distorted along with time. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll show you kind of an interesting thing here. Often in relativity, we look at um, space and time axes. Consider the x-axis to be the time axis, the y-axis to be the space axis. So if I start here at time zero at the origin, and I do something like this, as time goes on, I'm moving some distance away from my starting point. I could then sit there for a while and then move back. Okay? Now, notice... If I, you know, light would have a speed, well, let's you do this in units of C. So the speed of light is that, a, a 45 degree angle. Notice this line right here is my velocity, essentially, which is very close to the speed of light. There is, it's impossible to have a line doing this, because that would mean my speed is greater than the speed of light. So we have what we call a light cone, where you have to live within that light cone. You can't move outside of that because you'd have to be going greater than the speed of light to do that. You also can't get any information from outside your light cone because something would have to travel faster than light to get to you from there. Okay, So you can move around all you want within this light cone, but other than that, you're kind of, you can't. Um, 
so anyway, um, I wanted to point that out. Let me get rid of the extraneous stuff I drew. Oops, there. Um, now, here's something interesting that happens, though. If you are moving relative to another reference frame, what happens to these axes is they distort. The time axis and the space axis do that. So now, if there's an object right here in space and time, notice we're only including one dimension of space. We're moving along a straight line. If you want to do two-dimensional space, we'd need to map two dimensions of space plus my one dimension of time. So we'd have to do a 3D graph, which I can't do on my, on my screen here. And if you want to graph three-dimensional space moving forward through time, you'd need a four-dimensional graph, which clearly I can't do. But anyway, here's a particular point in space and time, a moment and a position. Now, notice for someone in the, the outside, well, in the... the um, Ah, the um, I can't think of the word. The proper reference frame, this is the time it's occurring at. That's the location it's occurring at. But for someone in my moving frame where the axes get distorted, it occurs here on the time axis, which is a different place than it was on that time axis. And it occurs here on the space axis, which again is a different position along the sp than the, um, the regular space axis. So that's geometrically how space and time are being distorted. You can do it by axis rotations rather than by, um, uh, by direct computation. Um, interesting little side note there. Um, everyone hears the story about how Einstein was told he would never be good at math or, or amount to anything. Um, his high school geometry teacher, a guy named Minkowski, was the guy who said that. Uh, that um, Einstein is smart, but his limited knowledge of geometry means he's never going to amount to anything. Um, turns out Einstein did all this relativity stuff, and then Minkowski point notices that these Lorentz equations, the, these time dilation equations and the space equations, can be represented geometrically as well as algebraically. And so Minkowski, the only reason anyone knows about him is because he came up with a geometric interpretation of Einstein's equations. Um, the guy who said he would, would never amount to anything. So Minkowski would have never amounted to anything if it weren't for Einstein. Now, um, let's do a quick sample problem I have. Ooh, not much time. Um, but real quick here, I'll clear this. And let's say, once again, we have an object moving at a velocity of 0 0.90 c relative to u. Okay. Um, again, maybe um, you know, we have um, Maeve moving away from Zoe since we have twins here, right? Uh, and Maeve is being shot out of a spaceship at 0.9 times the speed of light. Zoe is standing on Earth watching her go by. Now, um, if um, Maeve takes a trip to a star that's 10 light years away, Ly is light years, and it takes her let's say 15 years to get there and back. Well, to get there, we'll say. Um, how long did it take from, uh, uh, from Zoe's frame and how much distance did she travel in her own frame? Um, in that case, we can use the equations. Now, by the way, I'll point out that it, it was really convenient to work in units of light years and years. Okay, so um, if you do that and you solve for time, you can use um, x equal. Uh, you can use v equals delta x over delta t. And if you do your velocity in units of c, like 0.9 c, um, you can do your time in years and your distance in light years. In fact, I'm going to modify this problem slightly and allow myself to do that. I don't have to make stuff up. Um, Maeve is traveling away from Earth. She's traveling at 0.9 c, and she travels to the star Sirius, which is about 10 light years away. How long does it take her to get there? Well, now we can just use v equals delta x over delta t. Okay? v is 0.9 c. Delta X is 10 light years. Delta T in her reference frame is just going to be plugging in. 
notice again, I, I plug in for light years and I plug in units of C, I can easily get delta T is 10 divided by 0.9, which is like 